Welcome back to our second day of Earth Optimism and our bird-friendly coffee hour. I hope you're gearing up for another great day of content with us. And I hope all of my co-hosts got enough sleep and uh, are ready for another full day of interviews, talks, all sorts of great inspiration. I thought I'd start the morning by sharing some of the comments and messages that we received over the past 24 hours. But instead, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to have to put down my coffee because I've mentioned that we're checking live what's going on. And so I'm going to read off who's commenting now. We have Greg Haynes on. So nice to have discovered some optimism today. Oh, that's awesome, Greg. Let's see who we've got on Twitter. <laughs> we have, we're being tweeted by, an, oh, the Argentinian embassy. Like we've got so many great things. Air and Space Magazine. Thank you, Air and Space Magazine. The American Indian Museum. Yeah, getting lots of love from around the Smithsonian. That's so great. Well, I'm going to, I mean, it's so awesome. It's awesome to see that we have all of this activity. I am actually here on Twitter and I will be all day. So feel free to tweet at us, use hashtag Earth Optimism. And you can also send me a message on Facebook or leave me a comment. And I promise. I'm looking and I will reply. Uh, but I'm going to pass it off to Laura now so she can tell us a little bit about what's going on today. Or Tasha, actually. I'll pass it off to one of you. <laughs> I'll give it to you, Tasha. That's fine. Oh, wait. <laughs> We're still getting our coffee going, clearly, and we are just it's early so folks. excited. <laughs> we hope that you are really enjoying some of this video content that we've been streaming all night and it will um that's what happens when we're not in our live sessions so you can go and you can continue to enjoy that um but coming up today during our session we are going to continue to show additional short content we're going to be checking in with the hubara conservation in the united arab emirates and see how the reforestation is going in panama we're going to look behind the scenes at cheetah conservation right here at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and hear updates from the friends at the San Diego Zoo. We will travel to the Amazon. We're going to learn about beekeeping there. We're going to get updates on elephants, coral reefs, and that's just a small sample of the content that we have in store for you today. So right now we have a video that celebrates an unsung hero from Goa, the Birdman of Chora. Out of the 17 islands, Shara is the biggest island of Goa. And to reach here, we have to get onto a ferry. Goa is known for its beaches and places of worship. But once you visit this island, I will prove to you that Goa has so much more to see. Boatman, and people call me the Birdman of Sharon. It all started in the early 1990s. I still remember that morning, I was going to school to answer my 10th standard exam. At the ferry point, I saw one foreigner couple looking for somebody to show them the birds. <laughs> I don't know which side of the bed. I got up that day. I decided to skip my exam and to guide them. Slowly as the years passed by, my boat rides kept increasing. I started getting the visitors from all across the world. That's how a Marathi medium student learned English and also about birds from the bird watchers. This ecosystem has given me a lot. I supported my parents at a young age and now my beautiful wife too. In these many years, I came to know that the people are not completely aware of mangroves and their importance. They were destroying them, either by cutting them down, polluting or dumping garbage in them. I started telling the local community 
that how these activities affected the fish catch, the birds and also the crocodiles. People started to think again on the value of mangroves and after protests, the movement of barges in the backwaters was stopped and people started to get back to the traditional ways of fishing. I also started making the visitors aware that apart from protecting us from the storms, floods, erosion, these mangroves are home to many types of birds. Once a week or two, when I don't have visitors, I try to keep the river clean. As I don't have my own children, but when the people ask me, I tell them that these all birds are my children. They are traveling thousands of thousands of kilometers to see me. I always take care of them in whatever way I can. Sharaw Island is a gift of small things. It is easy to pass on by and see nothing. But if you take the time to be still and wait, you will be rewarded by beautiful wonders of nature. I am Uday Tukaram Mandrekar and I live on this beautiful island of Goa called Sharaw. In addition to the digital content we will be sharing with you today, we have many incredible speakers and interviews coming up over the next eight hours. So we'll be discussing everything from environmental justice to global virus hunters. But for this first hour, we'll focus on our students and the impact they have on conservation. In just a little bit, I'll be speaking to four outstanding young people who are making a difference in their communities by getting involved with the Ecoteen Action Network. But first, we'd like to hear from the rest of our student lightning talks. First up, we hear from Aaron Howington, a JD candidate from Howard University Law School. Hey everyone, my name is Aaron Howington and I'm a graduating third year at Howard University School of Law. Upon graduation, I will be practicing environmental law, but today I would like to introduce you all to the work that my colleagues and I at the Howard University Environmental Justice Center completed in order to bring awareness to environmental injustice in our local community. Environmental justice is defined by the Equal Protection Agency as the fair, and fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, and national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. At the Environmental Justice Center, striving for this fair treatment of all people, especially those in minority and low-income communities that shoulder a disproportionate burden of environmental harm is our motivating purpose. That past year, my colleagues and I worked alongside the Patuxent Riverkeeper to draft a civil rights complaint to the Environmental Protection Agency this complaint alleged that federal funding 
for watershed rehabilitation under the Clean Water Act was disproportionately allocated, leaving those in communities of color along the Patuxent River with little to no funding to re rehabilitate waterways that are vital to their survival. We wanted to direct EPA's attention to the fact that wider, more wealthy communities were receiving substantial funding while their um, low income and minority counterparts received little to no funding for their projects. The EPA and other federal agencies are prohibited by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 from discriminatory allocation of federal funding in such a manner. So by calling attention to this disparity, we hope to achieve justice for these communities by changing funding behaviors. If you would like to know more, please reach out to us at the Howard Environmental Justice Center at ej at howard.com. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Next, we go up to Mongolia with Taryn romser cloden to study nomadic herders' adaptations to climate change. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Taryn bromser cloden and I'm a PhD student at George Mason's Environmental Science and Policy Program and I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of some really exciting research that um, I conducted as part of an interdisciplinary and international team uh, back in summer of 2018 in northern Mongolia. So our goal with this project was to interview um, members of herding families that had lived through um, the very intense social and ecological changes that have taken place over the past few decades in Mongolia, including the transition back to democracy, as well as a two degrees Celsius increase in average temperature, which of course is projected to potentially occur worldwide. And we had a number of guiding research questions when developing our uh, semi-structured interviews. Um, they're summarized here, but essentially we were wondering what kind of changes uh, people experience, what they sort of considered the most salient when we asked them, um, what factors were viewed as having causing these changes, and then how this sort of impacted their views on the future. And as you might notice, these are fairly um, open-ended kinds of questions. We really wanted our, our participants and our informants to, to guide the shape of our research. So we spent about six weeks in Mongolia um, at two different research sites up um, near uh, the border with, uh, with Russia, near uh, just south of Siberia. And we ended up talking to 73 different uh, Mongolian herders ranging in age from 18 to their 70s. And these individuals were from 49 different households, about half of which were from the first site and about half of which were from the second site. Um, and of course, given the... Um, semi-structured nature of our interviews and our interest in sort of letting people take the conversation where they wanted to take it. Um, we got an incredible diversity of responses, um, stories of uh, narratives, of change, of experience, um, and yet we also were able to find several common themes. So um, there is a ton of data that's come out of this project. We're still sifting through it uh, a year and a half later. Um, but basically the major challenges that people were facing um, were summarized here. So this, these all came up again and again when talking to people at both of these sites. Uh, so things that we can relate to climate change, like seasonal shifts, more extreme weather, degradation of pasture, but also things that are related to um, just the social changes, the economic changes that have occurred in this reason and uh, the interaction between these. Uh, but I can't go into too much details, unfortunately, just a quick talk here. I'd love to, to uh, if anyone wants to email me after talk and give you more detail, but I do want to highlight that um, with each of these challenges that was discussed, we also would be given narratives of the adaptive capacity and the resilience of the people in this region, um, really challenging the idea of, of victims of climate change and also highlighting a, a community approach to problem solving um, that we really want to, um, to focus on. And so the takeaway here is simply that we wanted, as researchers, um, we believe we have an ethical responsibility to support and document these narratives and the strategies that are being successful by those who know best, the people who are actually living it. Um, and again, we want to highlight the, the positive outcomes of this, that despite the fact that climate change has really affected this area, it is, it is resulting in individuals having an incredible capacity to adapt. So we need to support and, such, and foster that. And this uh, is part of an ongoing project that is continuing. So thank you so much. Um, I'd love again to share more information, so please feel free to email me at tbromser at masonlive at gmu.edu. And I, again, would hope to hear from you soon.
Our next lightning talk comes to us oh from my a chemistry gosh. major at Cal State University Channel Islands, Alexis Akala. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Alexis Alcala, and today I will be presenting on the research that I conducted in the summer of 2019 with Dr. Jesus Maldonado at the Center for Conservation Genomics located inside the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. As the title suggests, my research is on the non-invasive monitoring of the endangered San Joaquin Valley kit fox on the Topaz Solar Farm. The San Joaquin Valley kit fox is endemic to San Joaquin in California. This animal primarily inhabits grasslands, scrubland, and wetland environments in the area. It feeds on rodents, rabbits, and some insects and vegetation. One thing that I want you guys to take note of of these two maps shown of the San Joaquin Valley is the light brown and yellowish brown color that shows the habitat the kit fox live in. On the left side is a depiction of the environment as early as the 1900s. As you can see, the species had a high abundance of habitat to live in and move around in. However, fast forward to circa 2000, which is the map on the right side, agricultural growth took over their habitat so much throughout the years to the point where they ended up being listed as endangered and then later on deemed as rare. Due to urban and agricultural growth, scientists deemed Carrizo Plain, Servio Panoche Valley, and Western Kern County, all places found in San Joaquin Valley, to be deemed as essential to protect for the survival of the San Joaquin Valley kit box. In 2008, a solar farm was planned to be built on the Carrizo Plain, thus contracting the Center for Conservation Genomics to do a 10-year-long study on the effects of the solar farm um, that it had on the endangered San Jaquin Valley kit box. The Center for Conservation Genomics teamed up with Working Dogs for Conservation, an organization that utilizes trained dogs to locate scats so that we can monitor the kit fox without ever having to actually come in contact with them. I joined the research effort in the summer of 2019 and took part by analyzing 2018 scat samples so that the population genetics could be analyzed over the course of the last 10 years. I extracted DNA from each sample of scat, performed a method called PCR to amplify the DNA, and then further analyzed the DNA to determine individual foxes and their sex. I found that almost all the scat samples were identified to be as a San Joaquin Valley kit box. 72 were female, 50 were male, and the rest were unknown. This helped prove the hypothesis that the solar farm was, was indeed allowing for native vegetation to grow, thus bringing back native species like the giant kangaroo rat, which is good because kit boxes feed on them. However, with me finishing up the final year samples, the combined results over the course of 10 years make us optimistic about the future for kit boxes because it helped prove that the Topaz solar farm is in fact helping increase the number of kit boxes on site. So to wrap things up, I just want to thank all of my collaborators, funders, and supporters for making this happen. And most importantly, I want to thank you for listening. Have a great day, guys. You want to do the intro? Sure. Oh, we're back. Oh, and we're having so much fun being live. I hope everyone enjoyed my green screen. Um, please take a <laughs> screenshot. Use that green screen to your advantage and Photoshop me somewhere really cool. All right, <laughs> and now let's hear from a biology major at Santa Barbara City College, Diana. <laughs> Hi, my name is Diana Portugal. I am a biology major at Santa Barbara City College, and I was involved in a research project focused on animal-mediated seed dispersal in post-wildfire oak chaparral. Our project was conducted following a large fire that burned 258 acres of land in the eastern central valley of Santa Cruz in March of 2018. We wanted to see how effective it would be to use a seed disperser of the area to naturally restore the vegetation following a destructive event like this. Our project featured the endemic island scrub jay, a natural oak seed disperser with scatter hoarding tendencies and low satiation levels, meaning that they like to spread large amounts of seed in a scattered pattern around their areas. To conduct this experiment, we placed six different platforms in six different canyons along the fire scar selected based off of their accessibility as well as the type of vegetation that would be found around the platform. Jays were attracted to each of the platforms using a combination of vocalization and baiting. And the trials were conducted within a 15 minute time frame, tracking the fate of 10 different acorns, noting whether they were dropped, eaten, or cached by the jay. At the end of the research season, 
uh, seedling surveys were performed within a 20 meter radius from the platform site to find any sprouts that could be potentially attributed to any of the trials we conducted, as well as a control site that was set 100 meters away from the platform. The results showed that on average around 80% of the acorns cached by the jays were placed in within the fire scar, leaving a 20% that were placed within uh, areas outside of the burnt scar in the unburned controlled areas. A total of 19 seedlings were found in five out of the six platforms used. 18 of those were found within the fire scar and only a single seedling was found in the controlled area. The, the results overall showed a favorable outcome for our hypothesis as the data collected showed that canyons with platforms in them did have a larger amount of seedlings as opposed to sites that didn't have a platform in them. Results showed that animal-mediated reforestation efforts can be effective and might someday serve to reforest large areas of vegetation affected by natural disasters. Natural disasters that are continuously increasing in frequency and intensity. This research will be soon applicable to the real world. Thank you. Our final lightning talk comes from pharmaceutical science graduate student Natalie Chavez with a presentation on conservation genetics of the Southern River otters and American minks. Hello and welcome to my lightning talk. Today I'll be discussing the conservation genetics of the Southern River otters and the American mink. My name is Natalie Chavez and I am the former I2F Smithsonian Fellow at the Center for Conservation Genomics and I am a current graduate student at California North State University. I worked under Dr. Jesus Maldonado and his co-advisor Lillian Parker. So this is our laboratory in Washington, D.C., where we actually conducted this research. These are some of the equipment we used, and this lab is actually located in the National Zoo. So I would like to say a special big thank you to all of our collaborators, and of course, everyone in the lab. So let's get started. So the Southern River otters are actually the most endangered otter species of the 13 species. And as you can see here, they are in orange, so they're considered threatened. And this means that the species is at serious risk of extinction. Some factors that have put the otters on this list is water pollution by humans, habitat destruction also by humans, and illegal hunting. So as you can see here, our otters are located in southern Chile, and this is the population that we're specifically looking at. This is the Valdivian Coastal Reserve where they actually live, and we'll be focusing on the Kulun River and the Cahoon River. So let's get started. So this is where the story lies. The Southern River otters are actually native to Southern Chile, as we said before. However, the American mink are the invasive species, which means they're not native. They are not locals to that area. And they were actually brought in 1970 for fur farming. However, after a few years, a few of them actually escaped the fur farming and flourished in the wild. So um, before I continue, I do want to say that these are two different species. They do not mate. And as you can see here, there is a big size difference. However, our, um, the local scientists over there started in southern Chile started noticing that they actually started to cohabitat. They started sharing food and even sharing dens. And that's where the problem lies. So as you can see here, the... Um, American minks, they're actually semi-aquatic, so they actually do travel pretty far and have been seen to travel into the villages and interact with feral dogs. And that's where the problem lies because the southern river otters are mostly aquatic, so they don't travel very far. And we believe that the American mink could be contracting many diseases, including the canine distemper virus, and bringing it back into the dens and unfortunately, uh, possibly furthering endangering the southern river otters. So our collaborators in Chile are actually doing that microbiology. We're doing the genetics since they are limited in their um, genetic work down in southern Chile. And we're going to see, uh, what we worked on is we sequenced the otter and mink DNA to see the genetic diversity and the population structure. So those, the river otters are considered a bottleneck effect. 
So we have the full population here and then illegal hunting happened, water pollution, uh, which caused them to decline dramatically. And now we have this small population, which is a surviving population. And however, the minks are considered founder effect. That's when we have a full population and only a small portion of them escapes and starts a new population. But as you can see here, they're not the full representation of the original. So because the founder effect is very recent, we believe that the otters are gonna have more genetic diversity than the minks. So the way we did this is we use a non-invasive method of DNA extraction. So our collaborators in Chile actually set up camera traps and collected their scat and then sent it back to us. And in our lab, we actually <laughs> extracted the DNA from the scat and we studied their macrosatellites. But what are macrosatellites? Well, we actually analyzed eight of them and their specific repeats within the DNA that, that actually work as fingerprints and they tell us which otter is who. So in case we got a, a double sample of the same otter, we'll be able to tell who is who. And uh, these, mar um, these microsatellites are located in very specific markers, which are lo um, locations in the chromosome. So we actually analyzed eight microsatellites at seven different markers. So let's analyze one together. So this one is from marker R15R, so location in the chromosome. And as you can see here, it is homogeneous. And it's at 123, and because it's only one peak, it would be considered homogeneous. Uh, for example, big A, big A, and that's from one otter. And uh, um, we used gene mapper to actually analyze this. And this will tell us if we have the same otter in two vials, uh, in case we have more than one sample from, from the same otter. However, now let's, uh, let's examine a different one. So this one would be considered heterogeneous. And that is because we have two peaks. So for example, it would be big A and little A, and that would be for a different um, otter as you can see here. And this is our actual uh, data and results. Uh, this is all of our locuses, which are locations in the DNA. And would you look at that? There's R15R, which we just analyzed. And as we predicted, the otter alleles, there are more than the American mink. So there is a higher diversity, uh, genetic diversity within the otters than the mink, just as we predicted. So here's, here's a quick video of me preparing a 96 well plate. And I actually, learned, I actually ran 34 PCRs, which is about 2,822 samples. So the next step for the otters is to determine the number of individuals, sexting the individuals, and then sending the results back to our collaborators so they can start facilitating otters. So let's say that there's a lot of relatives living here. Maybe they can facilitate them lower. If, they, if a lot of them are living here, maybe they can facilitate them lower in the river so we can have more gene, uh, gene flow within that area. Also, if there's a lot of, for example, a lot of females down here, maybe they can start facilitating some up. So thank you for coming to my lightning talk and I hope to see you guys next year. What an impressive lineup of students. I'm so glad we were able to showcase their presentations. Now I would like to introduce two, or my first duo of Ecoteen Action Network students, Marika Staley and Alexandra Trapanese. Hi girls, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Hi, I'm good too. <laughs> Great, it's so good to have you. So Alexandra, you're a sophomore in high school and Marika, you're a freshman, is that right? Yes. Yes. Wow. Um, and you're both involved in the Ecoteen uh, Action Network Climate Action Hub. Um, so tell me about the types of climate actions that you've participated in or led. Yeah. Um, in September 2019, I organized a climate strike for my community that had a turnout of about 100 people. I realized through this that although the strike was primarily to protest government lack of action, it was also raising awareness for people at my school because I, I talked about it in a few of my classes beforehand. And by the end of the week, it was like most of the school seemed to be talking about it. And a lot of students began asking questions like, why is this important? And what can a strike do? So I thought that these questions were things that strikes that action should raise and that we should keep doing this to get the word out there that climate change is important. Very impressive. So tell me more, both of you, about the how important is it in your community um, 
to convey your efforts and motivation. How are you talking to your community about what you're doing and why is it important? Um, one of the things that we did was we created a Earth Optimism PSA for this summit that showcased some of our peers and why they're optimistic about climate activism. And yeah. yeah wow, that was... Can and can how did that go? I mean, it sounded like you know, when you were able to circulate ideas about a march, that was really exciting. How did people, um, how did people react to, to your message? Um, I think people were, especially in my community, people were, um, I didn't, i had never heard a lot of talk about climate change, especially in my school, but spreading awareness of climate change through these things really brought up a lot of talking and questions and, um, people started to take action. For example, I started a climate club at my school and we started with only three people, but the group grew and now we're like spreading awareness throughout the school. And a lot of, a lot more people are interested in climate change and a lot more people know that it's out there and it's important. Yeah. And it's affecting young people like you too. I mean, you obviously didn't start the climate crisis, but you guys are doing something about it and that is amazing. Um, so for all the young people that are watching this right now, I think they're probably wondering what they can do to combat climate change. You know, it, you know, from your perspective as two change makers in your community, what advice would you give other younger people? I would say that one of the most important things is just to stay educated on current climate issues. And I think if you know why this issue is so important and climate change is dangerous, then you'll be more likely to act and you can spread that and others will be more likely to act. Yeah, and um, I think because a lot of us have, a lot of youth have grown up with climate change is always, climate change has always been there and it's always been a like looming topic. So I think it's important not to get too comfortable because climate change has always been there. It might seem familiar to us and we might just like take it for granted that it'll always be there, but there has to be a sense of urgency because it can't always be there. We have to do something about it. And really quickly, we've only got a few, uh, we've got 45 seconds left, but I want to hear from both of you. What has been your favorite moment so far on your journey? Something that inspired you or just a, a, a really awesome moment? I think my favorite moment was um, in my climate strike, we crossed a bridge um, over the freeway, and um, there was, like, a lot of honking of support. We stopped there for, like, 20 minutes, and um, people were just driving by, like, hundreds of people in their cars honking, and it was pretty amazing. Amazing. Um, I think my favorite moment was watching all of the videos that people have made for the Ecoteen Action Network um, video competition. Those were pretty incredible. It's a great answer. So that's about all the time we have. You girls are doing amazing work. I'm incredibly proud of you. Alexandra, Marika, thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome. So now let's take a look at a quick Ecoteen Action Network video on climate change. Hi, I'm Ava Lakey. I'm a teen ambassador of the Climate Hub with the Ecoteen Action Network, partnered with the Smithsonian. Hi, I'm Marika Staley, an Ecoteen Action Network Climate Change Hub ambassador. I love working with the Ecoteen Action Network because it has connected me with people and organizations that are passionate about the climate. The Ecoteen Action Network is an easy way to connect teens on important issues. The Ecoteen Action Network has allowed me to become more educated on current climate issues and has connected me and other teens with experienced adults in the Earth Optimism world. My favorite project we've worked on so far is creating a PSA video highlighting Earth Optimism. My favorite thing I've done with ETAN is help to create an Earth Optimism PSA and support the Earth Optimism cause. My favorite initiative done with ETAN was to organize a climate strike in my community. I'm impacted by this group because I'm sharing ideas with the climate club at my school and influencing people in my community to become more sustainable. I am advocating for a more sustainable community and sharing specific things we can do to achieve that. 
The impact I have had is spreading awareness of the severity of climate change, as well as sharing ways to increase sustainability. We meet once a week on Tuesdays at 7.30 Eastern Time, and we would love if you would join us. And here is one more from our Teens Dream video contest. When we talk about future, most of us think about youth, next generations, and how they will face the world. But what happens with the elderly? In our current society, we tend to set aside the old age for fast and busy lives, sometimes forgetting that for some of them, loneliness is an important issue and that they should deserve a dignified accompaniment. Nowadays, elderly people represent the 15% of the global population and will reach the 21 by 2050. This number will continue to increase, which means that this is a sensitive matter which affects us all. In the country where I live, more than 2 million people over 60 years old are living alone, and from those 2 million, 850,000 are over the age of 80. One of them could be your grandpa, your auntie, or even you in some years. Meet my grandma. She's 19 and has been living in an elderly home for the past three years, where I can see lots of older persons who spend most of their time alone. My dream is that no elder feels alone or unattended at this stage of their lives. Let's make their day by day warmer. Will you help? The solution I suggest for this dream is mixing ages in common spaces, such as nurseries, libraries, canteens, and make it usual in our daily routine. But as it seems that this will still take some time, what can we do as teenagers? Do you have some homework? Then go to your local elderly home to finish it. Or do you play an instrument? Go to your grandparents' home to practice. Do you have 15 minutes left before dinner? Give your oldest relatives a call. In fact, this is all about integrating the elderly in our everyday life. All together, a better future. Early in the broadcast, we got to meet Marika and Alexandra, two amazing eco teens working on climate action. Now let's meet two more inspiring young women, Ashley Chung and Sydney Rico. Welcome, Ashley and Sydney. Okay, so you both work on Hi there, zero ah, hunger and food to raised reduction, is that right? Yes. Yes. All right. So tell me what you've gained from your experience as change makers. What has this journey been like for you so far? So um, I feel like I've learned the value that comes from really owning my seat at the table, um, even surrounding these big issues like hunger and sustainability. Um, and at its essence, that means that I know that I have every right to kind of share my concerns and my ideas for action surrounding even, like I said, these big issues. Um, I think far too often the voices of people who have something important and um, kind of educated to say about these big issues are dampened. And um, I know that I really value my place in a community where I can make my voice heard. Yeah, and I get the sense that you are a strong and person think, at this table um, too. <laughs> Sorry, Ashley, go ahead. I think it's okay. Specifically with this hub, I've learned a lot of valuable techniques and strategies for making change and now and in the future. I learned practical skills like how to network, write grants and speak in front of big groups of people. And I think the experience of having an adult mentor and a global network of passionate teens has also opened up a lot of opportunities. And most importantly, my experience in this hub has shaped me as a person and helped me feel comfortable being a leader and speaking my mind. Oof, you both are gonna be forces of nature when you're adults in the working world, I can already tell that. <laughs> so, so answer me this. What do teens bring to the conversation <laughs> surrounding hunger as it relates to sustainability? I think that we as teens don't have the same obligations as older generations. 
we haven't done things the same way for years. And we have the will and the ability to think outside the box and not just work the system, but work to change the system. We as young people have an idealistic outlook on life and knowing that we have our whole lives ahead of us to make a change is an empowering thing. Why not get started right now if we can? Awesome. Well, um, I, I think that you're absolutely right. Teens, they've got a very focused perspective of what they want to do. They're not involved in politics the same way. They, they've they just got their whole future ahead of them, and they want to make sure that it's a bright future. And that's very understandable. So how can teens get involved outside of their schools? I'm sure there's a lot of young people watching right now. They are looking to your your advice as what to do. So so tell me, what, what can teens do outside of their schools? Um, so to kind of, to kind of get a sense of value and, um, and like action that they can take outside their schools, teens can take to social media. Um, they can reach out to friends that they know are involved in movements that they care about, um, anything from hunger to sustainability, really, um, and everything in between. Um, there, teens, organizations like that um, are always looking for teens who want to get involved and have that passion. Um, they really want to create these amazing change makers. Um, and you can also get involved in the organization that support that supports Ashley and I um, called the Eco Teen Action Network at globalcollab.net. Um, we are always looking for hub members, passionate teens who want to get involved and create an impact. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Ashley, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, and I think that we as teens, it's so easy for us to get involved. Like there's so many different ways we can do it. And all that needs to happen is that we need to take initiative and we can do big things in the world. Um, it's, it's super, it's so easy to make change, I think, especially in this generation where we have so much technology that's available to us. Like even right now, um, during this crisis, we're all, we're all at home. We can still connect over video and discuss our ideas. Yeah, isn't it amazing? With just the fact that we're doing this right now is amazing. I feel your energy and I think that you guys are movers and shakers and I cannot wait to see what you guys are gonna do in the future. We're just about out of time, but I wanna thank you both for your incredible work. Ashley, Sydney, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm 17 and I live in Washington, DC. Hi, I'm Sydney. I'm from Northern Virginia and I'm 16. Hi, my name is Magali. I'm 15 years old and I live in Catalonia, Spain. My name is Laia Martinoy and I'm from Catalonia, Spain. We are the Zero Hunger Hub and we are a collaboration of adult mentors and teens working to stop hunger in our local communities. We meet virtually every week to discuss our ideas and plans. What I'm really looking forward to in being this Zero Hunger Hub is working with teens all over the world for the same purpose and then get the maximum of people around me involved. I'm in the Zero Hunger Hub because I like to share ideas with other teenagers from all around the world and also to work together to improve communities. Since our hub's founding in 2019, we've worked on a series of projects under UN Sustainable Development Goal 2, Zero Hunger. We hope to end hunger, promote food security and improve nutrition, and support sustainable agriculture. Our first project was a collaboration with the Plastics Hub, where we put on an open house at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. We helped teach local teens how to conduct a waste audit and share their successes in creating change. We've also worked on an infographic campaign focused on educating teens on how to work towards food sustainability in their own lives in different ways. And in February, we taught a workshop at LearnServe International's local teen summit, where we showed teens how to begin their journey towards food sustainability in their schools. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have turned towards virtually advocating for gardening, a great way to nurture our bodies and our minds while we are staying at home. We can't wait to get started next fall on bringing food and a spirit of sharing to young students. With the DC Food Project, our hub will be implementing share tables at public schools around Washington, DC. 
Through this hub, I've been able to give of my time and energy towards something I believe in, but I've also gained so many incredible experiences. I've been able to clean out trash traps at the Anacostia River and learn how to conduct a waste audit at the National Museum of Natural History. This hub has served as a place where I can give, but also receive. I've grown as a leader through my experience with the hub. Specifically, my work has given me an understanding of the value that comes from listening intently to my peers and consulting experts. I also wear my badge as a change maker in the fields of sustainability and hunger with pride because I know that I'm backed by a community of earth optimists at my side in action. Thank you for watching and join us at teenstreamcolab.org slash zero hunger. Welcome back. If you missed any of the summit broadcast yesterday, don't fret. We will be restreaming all weekend, so be sure to tune in. Maybe even hold a virtual watch party with friends to stay connected while staying safe at home. We've also been highlighting stories of optimism from our partners that were there with us at the inaugural Earth Optimism Summit in 2017. Lauren, do you wanna share some of those? Absolutely, Kat. We heard from Trina Noonan, the Managing Director of Health in Harmony, who had several optimistic updates to share since they partici participated with us in 2017. <laughs> Among them, research at researchers at Stanford University helped analyze their impact on the first site in Borneo. They learned logging households can or have decreased by 90%. Infant mortality has decreased by 67%. 52,000 acres of rainforest have regrown as primary forest lost, in, uh, lost as stabilized. Some of these great statistics to report among many others are, friends, are our friends at Health in Harmony. Thank you for sharing these updates with us. And now we have a message from Future Earth. Hello, my name is Josh Tewksbury, and I'm the Global Hub Director for Future Earth in the US. I wanna give you just a few brief updates on the important work being done within our global network of scientists, scholars, and innovators collaborating for a more sustainable future for our planet. Last year, we formed the Earth Commission, a group of leading Earth system researchers with a mission to develop scientific targets or guardrails to help stabilize vital systems like land, water, climate, and biodiversity, and to find a safe and just operating space for people on planet Earth. The ultimate aim here is to translate these guardrails into actionable science-based targets for cities and companies to help mainstream the business of sustainability. We all know what the two degree target means for climate, but fundamentally we don't have those types of targets for other important earth systems like water or like biodiversity. We're working as a part of the Global Commons Alliance to fix this problem. And we plan to complete the research phase of this project within the next year. Another development we're really excited about here at Future Earth is the upcoming Sustainability Research and Innovation Congress, or SRI 2021 for short. This Congress, taking place in June 2021, will be the first evidence-forward, solution-focused, transdisciplinary gathering in the sustainability space. We'll be making this an annual event in partnership with the Belmont Forum to unite decision makers, academic experts, industry leads, and social innovators for the common project of sustainability transformation. And we hope all of you will consider joining us next June in Brisbane, Australia. Finally, we're scaling up a new venture with deep roots called the Earth Leadership Program. This program is a direct evolution of the influential Leopold Leadership Program established here in North America. And through this work, we're aiming to take this program global, supporting regional cohorts of world-class, mid-career sustainability scientists as they create change through engagement with policy, governance, commerce, and culture. We're starting by relaunching the North American cohorts, and applications for the 2021 North American cohort are now open. Please share this opportunity widely with your networks. I hope these efforts have convinced you that even in these very challenging times, there's a clear case to be made for optimism in our shared pursuit of a better future here on planet Earth. <laughs>